Okay. Even though Montana is the largest organic lentil producer in the United States, I can just about guarantee you if you go to, you know, a supermarket, Safeways or, you know, some other kind of mass market grocery store, there might be organic lentils on the shelf that actually come from Turkey. In this episode of Voices from the Field, INCAT agricultural and natural resource economist Jeff Shazinski will discuss the 30-plus year history of the development of the organic pulse and legume industry in Montana and beyond. He'll be talking with David Oyen, founding farmer and CEO of Timeless Foods based in Ulm, Montana. Timeless Foods represents dozens of organic farmers growing gourmet legumes and heirloom grains using biologically diverse organic farm systems. Under the brand Timeless Natural Food, this lentil underground has grown into a million-dollar enterprise that sells to hundreds of independent natural food stores and a host of renowned restaurants worldwide. Jeff's new ATRA publication, Organic Pulses Production, Economics, and Marketing, will soon be released on the ATRA website, atra.incat.org. Let's listen. Good afternoon and good morning, or for wherever you're coming from today. I'm Josh Zinsky, Agricultural Natural Resource Economist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And I'm really excited today to explore the topic of pulses with my great friend, David Oyen, a longtime friend and colleague. David, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and a, and a quick version of the story of Timeless Seeds, now Timeless Foods. And I know about this, so please include the days of the Black Medic and the ultimate rise of organic pulses in Montana. Great. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good to be able to chat with you today. I am a third-generation Montanan. I grew up on a family farm near Conrad, north central Montana, where I still live. Uh, my grandparents were all Norwegian immigrants who were part of the great uh, homestead immigration from uh, Scandinavia and northern Europe to uh, here in Montana in the early kind of opening days of the 20th century. Uh, after attending college, getting a degree in religious studies and philosophy, I returned to the family farm in 76 uh, to build a passive solar house, experiment with a variety of renewable energy technology. And uh, beginning in the early 1980s to convert the farm to uh, organic production. So a big part of that uh, you know, conversion to organic was realizing that I really needed to find an alternative to synthetic nitrogen and other synthetic fertilizers. Thanks to a professor down at Montana State University, Dr. Jim Sims, I was introduced to a, an amazing family of plants called legumes. And with the help of synthetic rhizobia bacteria that, uh, that live in the soil or can be added to the soil, these legume plants have the ability to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form that is usable by plants. So it indeed was possible to, to replace uh, synthetic, you know, industrialized factory nitrogen with biologically produced nitrogen just by using uh, a certain family of plants. So uh, these legumes, they include a variety of trees and shrubs, also numerous forages that people are quite familiar with, crops like alfalfa, clover, vetch, so forth. Uh, and they also include some edible crops like dry peas, lentils, chickpeas, and edible grains. He asked me to uh, mention the black medic. My first real introduction to legumes in the crop rotation uh, also came from Jim Sims. And he had discovered, become familiar with a cropping system in Australia called the Australian lay system or clover lay farming. A lay, basically, uh, it's, a, it's an English word, I believe, that a uh, British word that pertains to pasture. So rather than just grow, as an example, wheat after wheat after wheat on a field, the Australians discovered that rotating with a pasture crop, with a leguminous pasture crop like clover, uh, actually enhanced both the soil and the quality of the following wheat crop. So Jim Sims was very interested in this concept because uh, where this system was was kind of the most successful in Australia, in many regions there really kind of mimic the uh, the Montana environment in a way. Not so much the climate per se, because they're more a Mediterranean climate, but the fact that it was low rainfall, relatively low fertility soils, and so forth. So what Jim did was uh, he, he developed a variety called George Black Medic from plants that he just found in the roadsides naturalized around Montana and promoted this system as uh, a possibility for Montana. So the genesis of Timeless really was 
trying to understand, to experiment, demonstrate this clover lay system on our own farms. And Timeless was formed by three friends and myself in 1987. And our original concept for the business was to harvest these seeds and then promote it to other farmers uh, in the Northern Great Plains. Uh, at that time, we were kind of under the fantasy of the fact that we were going to transform agriculture across the Northern Great Plains with this amazing cropping system that used actually self-seeding, self-regenerating uh, legumes uh, as a replacement for, in those days, cultivated fallow uh, in the 60s yeah. and 70s and 80s. Most yeah, they... farmers up here cultivated one year and then grew wheat the next year. Yeah. Dave, that, that it kind of, I mean, I, I'm going to move on to, but just a quick, quick question there, because yep. I, I arrived in Montana about, uh, about that same time, about 1991, I believe. Okay. And, and I remember the first farm tour I went to was the early versions of the Montana Lentil Pea and Growers Association. Okay. <laughs> and, right. and I do remember that they're all thought of as being kind of crazy. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> they were very not well attended <laughs> things. And then yeah. I re- learned about Jim Sims and your black medic. And oh. Oh, okay. And the idea sounds really still so poignant as to, and I know, I know perhaps the naivety, but it seems why didn't it work? I mean, why yeah, couldn't it work? Well, work? you know, yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it it definitely could, you know, and it has worked in Australia for decades. Uh, it really kind of got its uh, got its start or got its adaptation in in Australia uh, probably in the '40s, and uh, Jim Sims experimented with it in the '60s here in the. In the U.S., kind of really started promoting it in the 70s, which is where we picked it up. And then, you know, we started Timeless to grow that seed in the uh, in the mid 80s. But for a variety of reasons, it never really took off. Part of that was just a psychological barrier because part of the real key to the and beauty to the clover lay system is that these these clover crops have hard seed. So what a farmer does is allow them to go to seed the first year. So you've got this huge seed bank in the soil and some of those seeds will sprout right away, but but uh, a high hard seed content means that some of them would volunteer the following year, some of them, you know, the year after that and so forth. So kind of the beauty of the system is the fact that you know, uh, it regenerates itself with proper management, at least theoretically, you'd only have to buy seed once in any given field. But not a good psychological issue. What the psychological issue was, you know, for farmers who are used to annual crops, you know, using you used to control, you know, especially, you know, conventional farmers used to control what's growing in the field. Anything that volunteered is a weed. So we spray it out. (laughs) Right. So our biggest challenge was, you know, and and we got this question, you know, a lot from farmers who tried to introduce this and they sort of got the concept like, wow, that's pretty cool. But how do I get rid of it? Right. It's like, no, that is the wrong question. Right. It's like, how do I keep it volunteering? That's a challenge, you know. Well, that's well, an interesting business model if you, you know, if you can't sell seed every year. <laughs> well, well, exactly. Okay. 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 Busted. Right. That's exactly a fact, Jeff. Right. 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 So it's not a business model, but you know what? It's a cool idea. Right? I graduated in religious studies and philosophy. Right. I did not graduate in business, right? Which was a. But there you are. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on to the next yeah, question yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. That's a uh, good, great you know, introduction. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, yep. Yeah. And, you know, uh, let, let me just finish up because th- there were a couple other, you know, kind of negative yeah. impacts. And, right. and and one was uh, USDA farm policy, you know, and, and it's kind of complicated, but farm subsidies back in the day, you know, really did not uh, reward alternative crops or, or alternative cropping systems. So, so actually farmers were punished by planting a crop in, in, or, or having a crop volunteer in what normally would be a fallow year. So subsidies went down for farmers who tried this. And then the, the third one, you know, and, and to some degree, maybe the biggest was just the rise of chem fallow and, and the use of Roundup. So, you know, rather than, rather than having a cover crop growing in that alternate year, that fallow year, you know, Roundup just basically sprayed everything out. So while, while we were trying to promote a living biological system. Chemical companies were promoting nothing growing in that field that year. So anyway, uh, yeah. we we had three challenges, and you know the clover lay system, boy, it just never took off. Well, I hear you on the public policy, as you know. I could demonstrate over the years how crop insurance disincentivized that same process. Same thing, absolutely. It, it partly yep. that, but yep. anyway. Yep. So in a review of this great book, The Lentil Underground, Renegade Farmers and the Future of Food in America, it was said that growing lentils 
that fix their own nitrogen without the use of poisonous chemicals and synthetic fertilizers was the essential basis for your 30 year plus history to collect timeless foods. I think we've kind of covered this, but why is growing your own food such a hard practice for most farmers in Montana to undertake? Maybe we've already answered this, Dave, but maybe we could just go well, on a little bit more on that yeah. topic and yeah. add to it since we've hit yeah. it already. Well, you know, my, uh, my generation of farmers, you know, I graduated in high school, you know, in the 60s and returned to the farm in the 70s. You know, we had all grown up with increasingly simplified farming systems, right? Beginning in World War II. Well, let me, let me just go back a second. So my grandparents, you know, had, had very diversified farms or fairly diversified farms at least uh, to a large part due to the fact that they farmed with horses and, you know, milk cows, you know, every farm had a cow and had sheep and had pigs and everything. So you had to have pasture. So by definition, you had, you know, somewhat diverse farm system, but beginning in World War II is really when the industrialization of agriculture, you know, really came to the fore in America and, you know, and other places around the planet as well, I guess, especially Northern Hemisphere, but things became mechanized. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the technology, the chemical technology and so forth that was, that was utilized in the war, you know, was looking for an alternative market. So rather than, you know, rather than mustard gas, things were sort of retooled to be, you know, to be pesticide factories. And the same with, with fertilizer, it really traces its its history back to the explosive industry, you know, to bombs and, you know, to bombs and rockets and so forth. So in the early, in the early fifties, I mean, my, you know, my, my parents and I mean, most farmers around the country started adopting these industrialized systems, which meant that their cropping systems became more and more simplified. Farming became more and more a recipe. So when I moved back to the farm, uh, my dad still had some cattle. So he did have some, uh, some alfalfa, we put up hay, but the cropping system, was strictly cereal grains, which, you know, wheat and barley, uh, some degree oats, which all perform well in our semi-arid environment, you know, but there were no, no legumes, uh, you know, in that rotation, unless a farmer grew dry land alfalfa, which really doesn't produce very well. I mean, you know, frankly, in, in Montana, uh, to support a lot of livestock. So most farms by the, you know, by the 60s, definitely by the mid 70s, were really really simplified to a more or less monocrop. So when Timeless, you know, was on this, what was on this path to introduce uh, cropping rotations, basically back into the rotation, but a generation of memory loss, basically my father's generation in, in many ways, there was just, you know, a, a, again, a bit of a psychological barrier. Well, you know, I've always grown wheat. What do you mean? How do I grow this crop? Yeah. What do you mean? I, 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 I need to add, uh, you know, I, I need to add rhizobia bacteria. You know, and is there a market for it? The fact was, you know, back in the 80s, there really was not much of a market, a local market. Absolutely. I mean, none of the local elevators handled pulse crops, peas, lentils and chickpeas and so forth. There was the there was kind of the agronomic barrier. The fact that, oh, gee, we'd never, you know, uh, we've never grown this. The Montana State University doesn't have any any research data on it. I don't I, I don't see it in the field days at the at the research centers. And then if I grow it, where do I sell it? So there's a huge learning curve because. You know, it's not as easy as growing wheat and, you know, wheat and, uh, you know, and barley in many ways, uh, but also uh, there's a market barrier. And that was really, you know, part of the, you know, the value that I think time was provided in a very small way back in the day of providing the infrastructure to process, to buy, you know, to process into food grade quality and to market this alternative crop, which nobody knew how to grow and nobody knew how to sell. Right. <laughs> Including us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's actually a curious follow up here quick. But, you know, we've been doing this. We're doing this. We we're, we're, have this pul new pulse publication on organic pulse production. But I noticed in doing that background that, as I said, that the lentil, Montana Lentil Pea and Growers Association, when I arrived in Montana right. in 91, you right. know, the, and there's obviously a conventional non-organic side to legume production in Montana now. Oh, significant. Yeah. Huge. Huge. yeah. And and. and do you think that you had influence on that too? Or how have you guys worked in some sense together? You know, there's always this you know, theory that, you know, organic and non-organic people, they never talk to each other, you know, <laughs> they hate each other or whatever, which I think is, I know is bogus, but, but I wonder how much there was an interaction between the non-organic and organic Pulse folks, because as I said, they were, they weren't organic, but they were also thought of as crazy as much as many of the organic yes. growers were. Absolutely. Again, I guess they they were renegades too, in a way. So I'm wondering yep, how you absolutely. guys interacted in the day, in the day, and how that 
how you may have grown together or not. Yeah, well, you know, we those of us who, you know, who kind of realize the wisdom of increasing cropping diversity and and realize the value of replacing, you know, synthetic nitrogen with with biological nitrogen. Um, we were all after the same end in a way, you know, initially, especially it's like monocropping, you know, wheat and barley is just not really a wise, uh, you know, agronomic practice. So uh, we were absolutely on the same page as far as, you know, we need to we need to add these pulse crops, these peas, lentils, chickpeas into the Montana agricultural production systems. And then the, uh, the land grant university, you know, uh, beginning with Jim Sims, but you know, uh, the, the people who followed him as well, you know, really started focusing on and, and understanding and verifying the opportunity that Montana had in front of us to grow these pulse crops. And as it turns out, Montana is the number one producer of, of lentils and the number one producer of peas in America. It took 30 years, you know, but in many ways, we're there now. And in most years, there's there's a million plus acres in, of pulse crop production in Montana that is influenced, as things always are, when crops become a commodity, it's influenced by, you know, by global markets and by price and everything as far as who plants what in any given year. In many ways, we're then and, you know, and remain, uh, you know, collaborators and colleagues, I guess. And getting maybe to that, because I know the tension, and I'm kind of speaking this broadly, but is that I've, we saw in putting this work together is that, you know, uh, organic farmers do cover cropping. They always have. It's kind mm-hmm. of... It's right. it's By necessity. Right. By necessity. <laughs> but right. If you, you don't, you don't survive. Yeah. You don't survive. And, um, but, but then again, growing something as a cover crop and growing something as a commercial crop, of course, are, are somewhat of a distinction. And, That's right. And, and people have a hard time with even particularly non-organic, I have to say, you know, with cover cropping in Montana, period, they seem mm-hmm. to suggest that it's not possible, you can't do it, blah, blah, yep. blah, yet I, I see all these people doing it. And certainly you, in a way, you could say the pulse producers are doing it in in that sense right. too. But in, in running an organic production in the dry land conditions that we're talking about, because I think most people in the United States don't really understand semi-arid farming yep. <laughs> right. over the years, what has been the key to success in pulse production. I mean, either even as a commercial crop and or as a cover crop, because I know that still seems to be a barrier. And how have you guys kind of worked that out and made it work <laughs> or not? Simply put, it boils down to market, right? If farmers can make more money growing lentils than they can growing wheat, they will figure out how to do it, right? And, you know, and now that there's university support and the whole, you know, and the whole market support that I'm mean, and not only timeless, I mean, you know, initially timeless was the only organic pulse crop entity in the, you know, in the state of Montana. Well, now there are more, you know, now there are, you know, national and, you know, and, and international companies that, that contract conventional acres here in Montana and, and, and even to some degree uh, organic acres in, in, in Montana. It really is market driven, ultimately, I think. There's a learning curve, you know, but farmers can figure it out and farmers do figure it out and farmers have figured it out. And, you know, there's always farmers that are more progressive and, you know, some that are leaders, some that are followers, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and that's another thing I'm I'm always concerned. I've been working on a lot of my life, too, is is profitability. And of course, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm an economist, so. I always think, well, if it's like, as you said, if it's profitable, if I can market, can make more money at it, I'm going to do it. And yet I have seen that as not always being the driver, not all the time, because you could show and demonstrate to a lot of people that something's profitable. And yet there seems to be barriers. Maybe it's policy, maybe it's something else. But Mm -hmm. but even in organics, there's there's a kind of a intellectual academic debate, let's call it, about whether organic is profitable generally, but let's say just keep this back to pulse. So is the pulse production profitable? And, you know, everybody always hears about the higher prices, but then I always come back and say, well, well what about the cost of production? Right. And because it's always a balance of the two. That's right. uh, and so is it profitable? And, you know, is it consistently profitable? I guess enough so that people, theoretically, economically rational people, <laughs> will simply say, well, it's more profitable, therefore I will do it. And if it took 30 years, then we could kind of argue that the rational economic incentive of profitability takes a while. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, it is complex in the sense that without the infrastructure, the traders that buy 
that buy the product, the processors that clean the product, you know, and the marketers that, you know, that, that, that market the product. And some of those, you know, are, are, are one entity and sometimes it's two or three entities along that, you know, along that value chain. So even you know, if it's profitable, if you can't, you know, if, if you can't sell it and if, and if nobody is in a position to clean it and market it, you know. Do, do you, I guess getting more specific then, do you, do you have any sense with your work and working with farmers of the relative cost of production? Is it, is in other words, growing organic lentils more costly than non-organic? I mean, I have some, some stuff we found out in, in interviewing folks about that, but just from your perspective, more intimately involved with the producers on this, I mean, what, what, how would you answer that? In terms of, um, of cost. yeah, yep, yep. I would, I, I would answer that. You know, generally, yes, it is more profitable. Part of the reason for that is, is that uh, organic pulse crops pay a greater premium than than cereal grain crops do, right? So, I mean, currently, I think, I mean, lentils, depending on the variety, but you know, they're kind of in the, in the, in the low to mid twenty cents a pound, uh-huh. right? And I think. You know, farmer price. You know, bin run farmer price. Organic lentils are about twice that. You know, right. in the past we've paid three, four times that. And, and is the cost of production, in your estimation, significantly different between organic and non-organic lentil pulse production? You know, uh, you actually probably would know know that better than <laughs> I do, frankly. I just right? wondering, right? maybe, right. and you're, you know, right. talking right. about it because no, it's and I, I do wish I did know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. we did yeah. suggest in our publication that there, there's always the trade-off. Oh, I'll give you just one insight that we picked up was that, for instance, like uh, the concept of shattering mm-hmm. and, and using desiccation. Yep. Yep. You know and that that obviously, if you can des, and, and maybe we need yep. to explain to the viewers that. that non-organic will spray an herbicide to kind of get a uniform so that the seeds don't shatter so that you get a higher yield. And of course, that right. app, using that technique will probably gain you some yield because you don't begin to have that. And, and organic growers seem to have, have evolved different ways to deal with that. But just Doug Crabtree, a farmer that we interviewed, you know, was Good. saying, well, of course that was that was more efficient, but I can't do that. And therefore right. it's more time, energy, and labor perhaps yeah. in harvesting. Yeah. Therefore yeah. that cost, at least that part of the cost is higher. Now yeah. other things, other, of course, of course he didn't have to use the herbicide either. Right? So there's right. a cost of reduction. So it isn't always so clear and easy, but that's just an well, example that, yeah. that sometimes organics will benefit you in terms of costs of production, but sometimes, and then I think it's also the management, which is so hard to economically evaluate yeah, to monetize, how, much, yeah. to, yeah, how mm-hmm. to monetize your knowledge and understanding that takes time to learn how to mm-hmm. do something very differently than as you suggested earlier, a recipe, yeah. kind of a very simple yeah. recipe in a simplified yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. So and, that and was my any, answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, that's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just yeah. thought maybe you that was something that came up with like, damn, you know, the prices aren't going up fast enough to keep up with my costs or something like that was happening in the organic market. But uh, doesn't seem that has quite happened yet. <laughs> well, yeah, it uh, hasn't quite happened yet. And, you know, with uh, with organic production, you know, in particular, you can't just take a one year snapshot and say, you know, was it was it more profitable or less profitable? Exactly. Right. Because in any given year, you know, it might be yes, might be no. But but with organic farming, I mean, by definition, they're crop rotations, right? It yes. might be two or three or five years, you yes. know, or, or or in some cases, it's a it's a 10 or, you know, eight or 10 year rotation. So yeah. a person really needs to look, you know, at the entire system because you're actually not just growing lentils, right? It's lentils in as part of a series of cropping rotations that include, you know, cover crops. I mean, in, a, in an eight year rotation, there might be two or three or even five years in that rotation. That's actually a cover crop. Exactly. So if, if you ask of that field, you know, in that year, you know, did I make any money on this cover crop? It's like, well, no, I didn't make any money, <laughs> you know, because I didn't harvest anything, right. I grazed it or, you know, maybe, but most likely in dryland agriculture, you know, there may not be livestock involved. It's yeah. like, well, you know, you just, you just, uh, you terminated it in some way or another, right? Which, yes. I mean, costs you, it costs you some money, right? To run that tractor, to buy the machine or to rent the machine yeah. that, that, that terminates that crop, you know, but if you stand back and look at it three years, four years, five years perspective, you get both a positive because, well, the wheat following the lentils, you know, or the, or the chickpeas or whatever actually did a lot better. In my field that did not have chickpeas before. So is that does that make the wheat 
profitable, you know, or does that actually add value <laughs> to the chickpeas? You got it. So I think you're, yeah. that's a really good point. And I think one that researchers should pay attention to <laughs> because yeah. we all tend to think to uh, poor, not me, I'm, a, I'm not that kind of economist. But yeah, of course not. <laughs> but, but, but no, but, but we all, we do think short yeah. term. There's a whole right. theory of that too. But, and, and I think, yes, how does something work over a three to five year period versus, or even longer and mm -hmm. overall? And, and that may be more important for the concept, for instance, like resiliency and yeah. other things that are becoming oh, exactly more fashionable. Right. Yep, yep, yep. And, I, yeah. and I'll tell you, you know, actually uh, one of the feedback that we got, you know, early on when we started selling uh, lentil seed, uh, there were some farmers up here in, you know, in, in North Central Montana, kind of progressive farmers, and they wanted to, they wanted to plant lentils and try them out, you know, and more than once we heard that, you know, even if I don't make money on my lentils, my following wheat crop is so much more, you know, valuable because higher yield and higher protein. They said, I don't care if I make money on the lentils, I'm going to plant them anyway. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I can replace or at least diminish my use of synthetic fertilizer, but also the quality of the wheat has improved. Right. So e even in a conventional scenario, I think, you know, I mean, many farmers are finding that pulse yeah. crops are yeah. a valuable Which is kind component. Of, yeah, kind of an argument for cover cropping, <laughs> obviously. Exactly. Again, <laughs> there we go. It seems that organics, you know, from our research too, we... Uh, is it seems that organic pulse supply may be overtaking demand. Can the organic movement lead to a new way of solving the oversupply conundrum that non-organic commodity agriculture has fought for and had problems with forever, uh, particularly for the benefit of the farmer? I guess I'm getting at is that we know that a, a, an argument a, a non-organic farmer might make is, well, you know, you guys have this quote niche market and there, but you know, and you have this better price now because you're in the niche. But if we all became organic, we'd all oversupplied. We'd have all the same problems that farmers have always had. And we're not gonna solve that problem by becoming organic. So why bother? <laughs> is that too harsh of a way to say it? Or that's basically what do you think? A, well, I think that's basically a fact, okay? <laughs> the organic, market at the retail level this year in the U.S. is something like $54 billion, right? I mean, when uh -huh. I started organic farming back in the 80s, it was like $10 million or something like that. You know, it, was, it, was, it, it, it hardly existed. And the organic market has increased, you know, between 5 and 15% annually. I mean, every year, right? So now we're at $54 billion market. That gets the attention you know, of the private equity people that gets the attention of international grain companies. So bigger players, you know, especially over the last 10, 15 years have come into organic production, organic premiums, you know, everything has hit the radar screen of a lot bigger players. So now we have an international grain company contracting organic lentils in Montana. Okay. So, I mean, it's almost by definition. Well, I mean, on the one hand, a lot of organic products have have basically been commodified right because it's no longer connected to a farmer it's no longer connected to a particular place you know it's no longer connected to a particular practice for all the advantages that the national organic program has brought to the organic industry one of the disadvantages it has brought actually is to kind of commodify you know organic food in the sense that customers see oh well it's got the organic seal on it so it's organic it's good enough for me what that has meant is that whereas, you know, I think 20, 30 years ago, people who bought organic food were not really consumers. They were food citizens, right? They were choosing their food because of, you know, maybe health advantage, but, you know, but, but the environmental uh, advantage, the social advantage of supporting a farmer that they knew was very real, you know? And I think now, you know, to a large degree, organic production has become, you know, commodified. I mean, there are huge huge companies growing, you know, thousands of acres of organic carrots now, you know, and mm -hmm. it's increasingly the case, you know, in the pulse industry as well. Okay. And a consequence of that is there is going to be overproduction, mm -hmm. right? Because these big corporate entities have the capacity, have the financial ability to ramp up production significantly and to flood the market. But we're definitely seeing that, you know, I mean, uh, even, though Mon <laughs> e e even though Montana is the largest organic lentil producer in the United States, I can just about guarantee you, if you go to, you know, a supermarket, Safeways or, you know, some other kind of mass market grocery store, there might be organic lentils on the shelf that actually come from Turkey. 
it's kind of a sad irony, right? But it's just, you know, for better or worse, it's the American <laughs> way, it's a capitalist way. And it's like, well, that's yeah. just the reality. Yeah. I guess that's the conundrum. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. I guess I was trying to think, I was wanting you, Dave, to come up with some really wise way <laughs> to no. overcome that. Conundrum. Sorry. No. <laughs> Sorry. I've, I, I, I've, 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 I've become jaded over 30 years. I tell you? No, yeah, no, I doubt you have become that jaded. <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's go to the last question. What makes timeless seeds and food timeless? Where did the name come from? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the name ironically came from when we were, uh, the, the four founders were in a field of, uh, you know, I don't actually recall if it was, it might in fact have been uh, Black Medic. But anyway, we were out walking our own fields in those days. It was just the four of us, uh, the four founders, you know, trying to figure this stuff out. After an hour or two of discussion and dreaming and thinking and somebody told you what time is it and we all looked at our you know we, we, we all simultaneously lifted up our arms you know to look at our wristwatches which we all knew none of us wore wristwatches right because we we're farmers we tell time by the sun you know and uh, it was actually Jim Bargrover one of the founders said hey that's it we're timeless we're timeless seeds you know <laughs> and it <laughs> and it really just kind of fit, right? Because yeah. in a sense, we are hearkening back to clover lay system that had been successful in, in Australia, you know, but even further back because cropping rotations, using legumes, you know, growing lentils. I mean, that has been a part of, you know, of Mediterranean culture and Mideastern culture, you know, for millennia. Okay. okay so we're, we're timeless in the sense that this is an ancient food that, you know, that has value, both has value to the soil, has value to the environment and has value to, you know, to personal health. And then obviously now we are, uh, the, the most word now is, you know, is, is, is regenerative agriculture. In spite of the fact that farmers, you know, have grown these crops and use these techniques, you know, to some degree for decades, uh, agriculture, you know, overall, you know, has not been regenerative. So we've got a lot to learn. And part of what was the the genesis of timeless was well we need to regenerate the soil not with synthetic chemicals not with you know not with anhydrous ammonia we need to actually regenerate the soil with biological nitrogen with crop rotations and so forth and looking forward that's even more important now you know in the era of climate change in the area of in the era of you know increasing dietary driven disease and so forth it's like if we're going to be here in uh, in another generation or another hundred generations, we need, we need to start thinking in terms of being timeless, not in terms of thinking what's this harvest going to be. You know, we need to think about the soil. We need to think about the quality of food, and we need to think about the environment. So, well, that's a great ending. <laughs> we'll cut it there. Okay. Thank you very much, David. That was that was a Good wonderful up. time. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.